Awesome. Welcome. Well, just before we sit down, just before we sit down. Okay, let's read out of Matthew 11 verse, no, Matthew, what? Where me now? I'm right. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace and I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's pray. God, right now we just wanna slow down in your presence. We wanna hear your voice above the noise tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray that you're gonna speak to each and every single one of us, that you're gonna help us take a next step. Whatever we are needing, I pray that you are gonna speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you take your seats and welcome to church. I'm super excited. We are in week two of our unfor Unforced, listen to me, Rhythms of Grace series. I wanna say Unforced Rhythms because I wanna go with the scripture. And I've titled my message tonight, The Invitation, which is why it is up there in, and not Rhythms of Grace. And I absolutely love this um, topic, this kind of series that we, that we are kind of working around is basically for me, what I'm gonna talk about with Rhythms of Grace is healthy practices, healthy spiritual disciplines, healthy spiritual practices that help us be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and ultimately do what Jesus did. And so I'll be honest with you, I have been on a journey of this topic of rest, of spiritual practices for years now. And um, I'll be honest, I'm still journeying and I'm still learning. I fail, then I learn, and I fail then again, and then I learn again, and then I fail and I learn. And it's kind of this cycle. But that's the whole thing about following Jesus, is that you're failing, then you're learning, then you're failing, then you keep on trying, and you keep on adding new things in your life, you keep on taking new next steps, and ultimately the aim is to become like Jesus and do what Jesus did. So I'm really praying that this message is actually gonna equip you. This message is not like something I would normally share, but um, I'm really praying that this actually even gives you such a um, tickle your taste buds or tickles your fancy or something, that actually you're gonna go home tonight and go, how can I dive deeper into this topic? So that's my prayer for tonight. So I love memes. Anyone love memes here? Okay, I'm like a meme queen. I love memes. So I find these amazing memes. Let's look at the first one. Okay, therapist. What's going on in your head right now? Me. My mind is like an internet browser. 17 tabs are open. Four of them are frozen, and I don't know where the music is coming from. Anyone? Okay, next one. This is my favorite one. This, this, this is me right here. Trying to excel my career, maintain a social life, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. Anyone? Or is, it, or, or is that just me? Okay, tell the truth or shame the devil. We're in the house of God here, okay? So that is literally me. Sometimes, I mean, we laugh because it's true, right? We look at those and we go, yeah, that's literally me. I wake up every morning trying to just survive and drink enough water and, and stay sane, right? And we, and we laugh because it's actually true. But the question is, is this really the life that God wants us to live? Are you telling me that God wants us to live a life where we just trying to scrape through to the weekend, where we're trying to scrape through to the December holidays, where we're trying to scrape through to our next break? That is not the life God has planned for us because in His Word, it tells us that God has planned a life of us where, where we should thrive. It's a life of fullness. It's a life of abundance. So God does not want us to scrape through life. He wants us to thrive through life. That is what he wants us to do. So how did we get to this place? We look at our generation right now and we're going, everyone is busy. Everyone is over-connected, over-distracted. How on earth did we get here? All right, I mean, think about it. All my millennials, all right, where are my millennials at? We remember, uh, you know, those olden days where we had the corded phone and you had to stay in one position to chat to your friend from school. You couldn't move around. You had to stay in one position and you had a doodle pad, just me, because I got bored on the phone. So I kept on, just don't tell my friends that. But anyways, so you had your corded phone. It was, it was awesome outside because it was boring inside. So we always, you know, went on our scooters and our bicycles outside, right? 
ju- just me. Then we've got our baby boomers. Oh my, uh, where my baby boomers at? No, okay, no one knows what generation you're on. That's okay. Then we've got our baby boomers, which have absolutely no clue what's happening with technology because it's just so progressed. You know, I, no joke, I always make fun. Like, like CJ's dad is so funny. Actually, he is really technical. So like he's, he, like he's quite good with, with um, technology, but it's so funny when they like use like finger and they scroll and then they don't know how Instagram works. Why is this person sending me messages on Instagram? But it's actually a story that they've uploaded. Hilarious. Anyways, then you get our now generation. Okay, so our high schoolers, um, what's it, Gen Z or Gen, I think they're called Gen Z. Yeah, you guys, give me a cheer. You guys were literally born into this age. Are you born in with a smartphone in your hand, pretty much, all right? So you guys just know exactly what's crack lacking on the TikToks, on the, on the Instagrams. You just know what is going on, all right? So how on earth did we get here, right? Let me give you a little brief history. So back in the day, back in the day, we went to bed with the moon and we woke up with the sun. We were unconcerned about productivity. We, we were free of haste, right? Then the clock came in and changed all of this and it started giving us artificial time. The whole slog of the nine to five all year long. Now we stopped listening to our bodies and started listening to that awful siren that would come from our alarm clocks, not when our bodies were actually done resting. When the sun set our rhythms of work and rest, it did so under the control of God. But the clock is under the control of the employer, a far more demanding master. Jokes, we love you, Andre and Leanne. (laughs) They're not demanding at all. (laughs) Anyways, then we get 1879, right? Edison and the light bulb. Did you know that before Edison and the light bulb, an average person slept 11 hours a night? Now we are down to seven hours on average. There was a business review that Harvard did and it conducted a survey on the change in social status in America that leisure time actually meant more wealth. Remember when magazines, you know, this wealthy business person sitting in in the beaches of Hawaii with their drink and their, you know, all free of stress and pressure. That was the sign of wealth, that you had all this money to spend on going on these amazing holidays. Now, we're looking at the Times magazines and we're looking at magazines or things in general on social media. Now what a sign of wealth is walking down Times Square or walking down New York streets, meet uh, business meetings and high skyscrapers, that's now a sign of wealth. So it's productivity, it's busyness, it's on the go, we're moving, we're moving, we're going, we're going. That is now a sign of wealth. In 2007, the official start to the digital age, the year that Steve Jobs dropped that iPhone to the world, which started decreasing our IQs and our capacity to keeping attention. Now listen to this. The smartphone put the internet in our right front pockets. The average iPhone user touched their phones 2,617 times a day. A study has shown that even being in the same room as our phones, even turned off, will reduce someone's working memory and problem-solving skills. Now that's just our phone. What about social media? What about Netflix? What about your weather apps? What about the news apps? There's a thing called the attention economy. That a company, if if a company can get your money, only if it can get your attention. Our attention span is dropping everywhere. In 2012, before the digital revolution, it was 12 seconds. Since then, it's dropped to eight seconds. Listen to this, a goldfish has the attention span of nine seconds. We are losing to goldfish. (laughs) There's a problem here. Devices and apps steal our attention, but we're not actually the customer, we are the product. Every time we pick up our phone, we are dropped into an ecosystem of attention interruption technology. Ron Rollheiser says that we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. We are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. We are more distracted and more busier than ever. John Malcoma talks about the 10 symptoms of hurry sickness. Now I want you to take a look at this. You can take a picture or whatever, but I want you to see if you can relate to any of this. Irritability, you get mad, frustrated, or just annoyed way too easily. Hypersensitivity. All it takes is a minor comment to hurt your feelings, a grumpy email to set you off. Restlessness, when you actually do try to slow down and rest, you can't relax. Workaholism, or just nonstop activity. You want to stop, but you can't. Emotional numbness, you don't have the capacity to feel another's pain. 
Out of order priorities, you feel disconnected from your identity and calling, lack of care for your body, you don't have time for the basics, escapist behaviors. When we're too tired to actually do what's life-giving for our souls, we turn to our distraction of choice, overeating, over drinking, binge watching Netflix, browsing social media, surfing the web, the slippage of spiritual disciplines. And if you're anything like me, when you get over busy, the things that are truly life-giving for your soul are the first thing, um, f the, the first to go rather than, uh, what am I saying? The first to go rather than your first to go to, if that makes sense. Isolation, you feel disconnected from God, others, and your own soul. Anyone relate to any one of those? Because I look at those things and I go, I think I'm all of them. <laughs> oh no, okay. How can we change that? This is a very practical message tonight. I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay. We need to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. That's it. We need to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our life. Dallas Willard said that. So how do we do this? Okay, three quick things tonight is we need to come. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened. Come to me. This is why I titled it the, in, the invitation, because it is an invitation. The word come is an invitation. Come to me when you're pressured, come to me when you're stressed, come to me when you're upset, when you're confused, when you're doubtful, when you're overwhelmed, when you're irritated, when you're angry, come to me. The problem is we don't come to Jesus because we wanna get all our ducks sorted. We, or, like we first wanna be okay and have a couple of quiet times and then we come to Jesus. But Jesus is saying, come to me, even if you haven't got it figured out at all, come to me. It is an invitation to come as we are. It's an invitation. We need to come to Him. I want you guys to quickly just look at this. I'm gonna leave this here. This is the world, okay? This is us busy now. This is our hurry sickness. This is us going from one thing to another thing. We, we are not ruthlessly eliminating hurry for our life. We are distracting spiritual oblivion. This is us, right? Okay, now that's gonna be there for the end of the message, just so you guys remember that. The second thing is we need to learn. In Matthew 11, it says, if you walk with me and work with me, you will learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Look at this picture of this ox. They, so this is what he means by being yoked to Jesus. A yoke is a wooden beam normally used between a pair of oxen or other animals to enable them to pull together on a load when working in pairs. So it pulls the load in tandem. The yoke pla is placed on them to do the work. Now, an interesting thing about this is that you'll never have two experienced ox, uh, ox put together. You'll never have two inexperienced ox put together. You will always have one experienced and one inexperienced. And now in this image of us being yoked to Jesus, what does this mean? Jesus is the experienced one. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is our guide. Jesus is our coach. And what happens is when we yoke ourselves to Him, we learn from Him. We become like Him. We follow Him. We learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And you know, it's so easy because, you know, we're talking about, you know, rest and you're saying, okay, cool, Martine, but now you're telling me now I need a rest, but now we, we yoke ourselves to Jesus to do work. Now, isn't that a bit contradictory now? You see, the thing is when we yoke ourselves to Jesus, we are doing the work that is custom fit to us. That's why it's an easy yoke because it's made to fit to us. I'm gonna read something to you. It's not gonna come up on the screens. Dallas Willard wrote this about Matthew 11. In this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke. The secret involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. Our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists in loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully, while living the rest of our lives just as everyone else around us does. It's a strategy bound to fa fail. We hear about his easy yoke and, and soul deep rest and think, gosh, yes, heck yes, I need that. But then we're not willing to adopt his lifestyle. 
But in Jesus' case, it's worth the cost. In fact, you get, you get back far more than, than what you give up. There's a cross, yes, there's a death, but it's followed by an empty tomb and you portal to life. Because in the way of Jesus, death is always followed by resurrection. We accept God in our lives. We say we want the lifestyle, but we don't take the steps. Jesus' invitation is to take up his yoke, to travel through life at his side, learning from him how to shoulder the weight of life with ease. I wanna tell you something tonight, that an easy life isn't an option, but an easy yoke is. We come to Jesus and we think everything's gonna be perfect. Probably not, but an easy yoke is. Third one tonight is keep company. Matthew 11, once again, it says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And this is where I wanna dive into a healthy spiritual practice, spiritual discipline, whatever you wanna call it. And there's a whole bunch of these things. And and what these practices and these disciplines do is they help us be with Jesus. In other words, a quiet time, okay? We spend time with Jesus. That's what a healthy practice, a healthy discipline is. And so there's a couple of them that that we'll know of. Fasting is a healthy practice. Um, Prayer, slowing down, Sabbath, which we don't talk on enough. Simplicity, um, which is getting rid of things that don't mean anything and like less is more, minimalism vibes. Simplicity. Um, And the one that I wanna look at tonight, the one that I actually even wanna challenge you to take a next step in this week is silence and solitude. I wish that I had the next three hours to dive into this topic, but I can't. So I'm hoping that you're gonna get so excited about this topic that you're actually gonna take some recommendations at the end of this message and actually go try this out for yourself. I'm telling you now it will change your life. Think about when, when was the last time we were super bored? I'm thinking like 1995 when there wasn't smartphones, it's like dial up internet, when like sometimes you're just really bored. I don't know, anyone? No, just me? Okay. So load shedding when we get super bored. I actually think, okay, this is a complete side note. Sometimes I think load shedding can actually be from Jesus. (laughs) Think about it. There's no electricity. There's no Wi-Fi. What can you do to spend time with the Lord? (laughs) That's just a complete side note to this topic. I am back now. But okay, so looking at our smartphones, the pros of a smartphone, we have access to everything we need. The cons of a smartphone is that moments of boredom can be potential portals to prayer. 77% of young adults say that when nothing is occupying their attention, the first thing they do is reach for their phones. This can have profound implications on our relationship with Jesus that the new norm of this digital distraction is actually distracting us from being present, being present with God, being present with people, being present with our souls, and being present to life. Andrew Sullivan in his manifesto for silence in the age of noise, he wrote this. There are books to be read, landscapes to be walked, friends to be with, life to be fully lived. But this new epidemic of distraction is our civilization specific weakness. And its threat is not so much to our minds. Even as they shape shift under the pressure, the the threat is to our souls. At this rate, if the noise does not relent, we might even forget we have any. The noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God. And that's what I'm trying to get at. I know I'm like beating up on phones right now and I'm beating up on social media. They are, they are great pros to all these things. But I'm trying to get us to realize that we are in a distraction society right now, that we are being distracted from things that mean the most. I mean, let's look at the life of Jesus. At the end of Matthew 3, we see Jesus um, getting baptized. The, uh, the, uh, the Spirit descends upon him and God says, this is my child whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. Then he was sent by the Spirit into the wilderness. Fasted 40 days, 40 nights, be, uh, gets tempted by the devil. And you would think, Think of this wilderness place. You're thinking, this is such an interesting place. Like why would, like a wilderness doesn't sound like a great place, right? I know this is not a great place. I mean, it's hot. There's no food. There's no water. It's sand. Can you imagine walking in sand in the heat of the day? I can't think of anything worse. But what he's talking about is the Aramos. 
It's this Greek word, eremos, which means desert, solitary place, quiet place, lonely place, wilderness. Why did Jesus have to go into the wilderness? When we think of the wilderness, we think of this really bad place. But the thing is, when we think about the wilderness, Jesus goes into the wilderness, he's been fasting, he knows who he is in Jesus. We actually see that the wilderness is actually not a place of weakness, the wilderness is actually a place of strength because he knew who he was. He was, in G, uh, he was in God. In Mark 1, Mark 6, and Luke 5, we see Jesus um, taking himself to a place to pray. In Mark 1, we see that he got up and he went out to a secluded spot and play, prayed. Mark 6, he climbed a mountain to pray. Luke 5, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to an out of way places for prayer. This was the lifestyle of Jesus. And my question to you tonight, is that if Jesus, fully man and fully God, needed time to be with the Father, why do we think we don't? Jesus, let's think about who we're talking about here. I don't think he really needed it, to be honest. He's fully God. I'm pretty sure he had all the strength in the world to kind of make through things. But he needed to have that time alone. He needed to go to the Aramos, the quiet place, to be with God. And so getting into silence and solitude, there's two things, silence and solitude. Let's look at silence. There's an external silence, pretty self-explanatory. When we're talking about external silence, we're not talking about music playing in your headphones. We're not playing about Fortnite being played down the hall in the lounge, cough, cough, CJ, jokes. But I'm not talking, I'm totally just throwing him under the bus and he's not even here to defend himself. It's great. No, or I don't know what they play. All I hear is shouting and screaming from the lounge, okay? <laughs> but it's not, it's not um, shouting, screaming, TV. It's none of that. There's no external noise. St. Augustine said that entering silence is like entering into joy. Doesn't that sound just so beautiful? And I know this all sounds really like out there. I promise you, if you try this, it can change your life. Quiet brings emotional healing. So C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters, and I'm giving you tons of content tonight. I hope you're with me. C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters, he says that the demons are rallying against silence as a danger to their cause. The senior demon screw tape caused the devil's realm a kingdom of noise. We will make the whole universe a noise in the end. So the other day, um, we were practicing for our EP launch. On, on, on this past Wednesday. EP launch is coming up on this week, Wednesday. So book your seats. It's gonna be amazing. So we were practicing and there was a part in the night where I just needed to think. I just needed to concentrate. Now there's many of these nights, well, m many of these moments. I just needed to think. I couldn't concentrate because I had Kai and Saki. I had people humming melodies and then I had J Josh and Brendan jokes. I'm totally right. Then I had them like talking to one another and John is trying to talk to another person. I'm just having like, I'm totally throwing the worship team under the bus right now, but it's fine. I'm just having all this noise and, and like all this chitter chatter. And I was like, guys, can we all just keep quiet just for two seconds? I just need to think this through because I can't think when everyone's talking because I, I, I get, I start feeling overwhelmed. I start feeling anxious. I'm like I can't, I can't concentrate. But the minute everyone just stopped talking, I could actually just process and go, okay. Okay, I can think now. See, that's what noise does to us. Noise makes us anxious. Noise makes us overwhelmed. But the minute we still ourselves and we actually just think and process, silence is an amazing, amazing place. Then we've got the internal noise, which I think is probably the worst and the hardest. That mental chatter, that commentary in our heads of everything, our worries, idolizing, clutter, you know, all that stuff, all that junk. There's no off switch. This is the silence that we're talking about, external and internal silence. Then we've got solitude, pretty straightforward, alone with God and alone with your own soul. Now there's difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is engagement, isolation is escape. Solitude is safety, isolation is danger. Solitude is how you open yourself up to God. Isolation is painting a target on your back for the enemy. Solitude is when you can set aside time to feed, water, and nourish your soul, creating an environment to connect with God. Now, 
every time I read books on this topic, and every time I read content on this topic, I always get punched in the face. So I thought that when I was prepping for this message, I got punched in the face again. So that's why I feel like punching you guys in the face, because I don't want to be the only one being punched in the face. So we can all be convicted together, right? Is it? It's power in unity. So we all get punched in the face together. And this was the one that really punched me in the face. So let's all be ready for that little punch in the face that's coming now from the Holy Spirit. And Henry Nouwen says that without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and listen to Him. Anyone else feel punched in the face right now? It is so simple. The worship team can come on up. It is that simple. Silence and solitude. Being with Jesus. So right in the beginning, I obviously shook this thing, right? And you saw that it was super black because there's mud in here and there's sand and there's dirt. And I told you that when I shook this thing and you saw um, all the mud and, 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 and it was so dirty, I told you that that is the world, that, that, those, that that's our soul right now in a world of business, in a world of chaos, in a world of distraction. That's our soul. But this is what silence and solitude does, is that when you just sit for long enough and you quiet your soul, and you quiet your mind, the chaos starts to settle. Your stuff starts to settle and God can start dealing and start speaking. But when we are shaken up in life, we can't see clearly through that. It's chaos, it's busyness, it's just moving on to the next thing. And then what happens is then we all have meltdowns because we didn't wanna deal with our stuff. And then we're wondering why we've got hurry sickness is because we didn't sit for long enough to let our stuff settle for God to deal with our stuff. That's why I say silence, quiet brings emotional health because that's when He deals with our stuff. Now, before you write me off, <laughs> before you write Jesus off, because I have anything, He's the most important one, that, that we look to and that we learn to, I want you to think about what is actually at stake here. That when we disconnect from God, when we disconnect from God, when we start living off other people's revelations, you know, we listen to podcasts, podcasts are great by the way, but if that's all you're getting with your time from God, you're disconnected from God. I don't know about you, but there's been a time in, in my life now, I'm a super productive person. I'm driven, get things done. Like I wake up in the morning and I tick things off my list. I just wanna get things done. I'm super driven to such a point that I can actually damage my own soul if I don't take care of myself. So there was one point in my life where even my quiet times with God became super structured and super driven in terms of, when I did my version Bible plans, all I wanted to do was tick that box. And now the worst thing that they've done is now they have that th thread to say that, you know, you've done 10 days or 15 days, you know, I don't know what it's called yet. You know, those streaks. Don't like those streaks. <laughs> and so what happened was I had this complete markdown because I felt completely inadequate. I felt I can't spend time with God. I just keep on ticking these boxes off. Why do I feel so disconnected from Him? Why do I feel like He's not with me? And I remember at that moment, someone in my life told me, Martine, I don't want you to go read anything. I don't even want you to go pray. I don't even want you to go sing a worship song. I want you to go sit in your office or your room or at the beach, wherever you feel calm. And I just want you to sit in silence for five minutes and be present with God. I'm like, say what now? That sounds like my worst night to me. Because everything in those five minutes, my mind starts going there not to rein my mind back in again. No, we're spending time with Jesus. We're with God, I'm with you, Jesus. Now I'm with you. I had to say that for the whole five minutes because my mind was distracted into 10,000 other things. But you see, that's what happens because when things start settling, your mind starts going everywhere and you start thinking about everything else that, uh, that you're meant to be doing in those five minutes, but being present with Jesus. And so I'm not telling you 
to not go read the Word. And I'm not telling you to go not sing or to not pray. I'm telling you to be present with Jesus. And however that looks for you. Now there's different seasons. Maybe that's just five minutes for you if you're a new mom. Maybe you're a business person and you're running off to the next meeting. Why don't you take those toilet breaks to be present with Jesus? I know it sounds weird, but we can take any moments of silence to be still, to let things settle and see clearly and let God speak to us. That's the whole thing. Because when we disconnect from God, we lose sight of our identity and our callings. We get sucked into the world. We start getting anxious. We start getting overwhelmed. We get exhausted. We start lagging through the days. And then what happens is we start turning to the things that makes it worse. I am a massive culprit of this. All I want to do is escape on Netflix. That's all I want to do. I've watched Big Bang Theory about six times from 1 to 11 now in the last four years probably. I've watched Modern Family probably about another five times from season one season because sometimes I just want to escape. So I feel you. I know, I understand that all you wanna do is just switch off. But can I tell you, that is making things worse. It is making things so much worse. We become easy prey for the enemy. We start living from the surface of our lives and not from the core of our lives. The smallest things trigger us. There are signs and symptoms of a life without silence and solitude. So once again, maybe it's not for a full hour. Maybe it is just those two minutes and those five minutes where you just sit and you breathe and you decompress and you be still and know that I am God. Be still and the knowing will come. Sometimes we just wanna know God. We just wanna get, next thing. We be still and the knowing will come. So there's two options tonight. Option A, we either neglect this practice and to the detriment of our souls and our lives and what God actually has planned for us. Or option B is we actually practice this and we see what God does. I pray that we all go with option B. And I've seen, I've seen this in my own life and I really wanted to encourage you tonight to just try it. You're gonna find it really hard. You're probably gonna put your timer on for two minutes and you say never again, that was the most unpro unproductive two minutes of my life. But can I tell you, if you keep on doing two minutes of silence every day and you're present with God, you're gonna go from two minutes, to five minutes, to 10 minutes, to 15 minutes, to 45 minutes, to a whole, I'm telling you now, in a year from now, come to me and tell me that you, that, that you can't spend an hour in science. I'm telling you now you can, if you start now. Because it's a practice. And you're probably gonna fail and you're probably gonna hate it, but you just gotta keep doing it. And watch what God does in your life. So before we pray, I told you this was super practical. I wanna actually give you some book recommendations for my, now I'm a non-reader, I don't love reading. I like to listen, don't love reading. But these books have probably changed my life massively. The first one is um, The Invita oh, sorry, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and To Hell With The Hustle. These two books, um, yeah, it's the, it's the one with the red cover. These two books basically give an overview of the world that we're living in. In The Ruthless Elimination of Harry is where I got most of this content, I'll be honest, from this message. So if you hear anything that's the same, don't judge me. But um, he also talks on the four other spiritual practices. The second one is The Common Rule and an invitation to silence and solitude because it is an invitation God is inviting us to be with Him in silence and solitude. What I love about the invitation to silence and solitude is that she, she actually at the end of every chapter takes you through an, um, an exercise of, of how to actually practice silence. 
And so if you really want to get practical, I would really uh, um, suggest that book. And The Common Rule just gives amazing practices in terms of weekly practices, monthly practices like Sabbath, Scripture before phone, uh, one meal with friends or family. It's just amazing disciplines that you can put in your life that will help. And then the last one, probably my favorite, is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Why I love this one, and Peter Scazzaro has written many ones, Emotionally Healthy Leader, Emotionally Healthy Relationships, Emotionally Healthy Woman. Um, but this one, what I love about this one is it pairs with the uh, devotional, the day-by-day -day devotional. And what I love about the day-by-day -day devotional is that it goes into a daily examine, which is, oh, sorry, not a daily examine, the daily office, which is two devotionals a day. You can either do it in the morning or the um, morning and afternoon or afternoon and evening or morning and evening. And it starts off with a two minute silence as a devotional and then it ends with two minutes of silence. And what it does is that day by day actually is connected to the book. But can I encourage you, if you wanna do this one, take a year to do it. This one is pretty intense reading. It gets to the core of your being. It gets to your soul and it challenges you heavy but it's probably the most transformative book I've ever read. And can I say that if you wanna be a healthy leader, a healthy business owner, a healthy um, spouse, a healthy mom, a healthy friend, being healthy from our souls is the most important thing. And so these are some recommendations that, that, that I wanted to give to you guys as your next step. So I, that's it. I just pray for you guys that something stirred, was stirred inside of you to take this on in your journey. So where you at, why don't you close your eyes? And I wanna pray with you because maybe there's some of you here tonight that say, this is great, Martine, but first off, I actually just need a relationship with Jesus. And if you wanna recommit to Jesus or you've never given your heart to Jesus, this is your time. And it's pretty simple, it's not this religious thing. If you just acknowledge that Jesus died on a cross for your sins and three days later, He rose again and He's now sitting on the right-hand side of the Father and He's praying for you. If you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth, the Bible says that you will be saved. It's that simple. And so if you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, Martin, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want this, this, this easy yoke. I wanna to come to Him, I wanna accept the invitation that Jesus is giving me tonight. And if you want to give your heart to God, why don't you just, just give me a wave or just raise your hand where you're at. One of our team will see you and we'd love to help you take a next step. God, we pray that you will help us slow down to be present with you. God, you are a God that gives us an invitation to be with you. And I pray that we are gonna accept that invitation from this day forward. That we are never gonna be the same again because we're gonna be in your presence. We're gonna be with you, we're gonna become like you, and we're gonna do what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, come on, let's just thank Martine, let's honor her. So listen, you know, even as you're listening and maybe you know you need to start to put some framework, one of the books had that picture of a calendar and sort of that vine growing through it. Uh, what you're doing is you're actually just putting that structure in place that this amazing sort of tree can grow on and uh, well, this plant can grow on and fruit can come uh, come into your life. So so if you really don't have any sort of rhythms when it comes to your relationship with God, um, I encourage you to get some rhythms in. Uh, one of the ways to also add a healthy rhythm to your life is to not only get to truly know God, like Martin says, in the church, we don't want you just to know about God. We want you to know Him personally. It's a real relationship for you. We also want you to find purpose. Um, so Growth Track is going to help with that rhythm where you're going to discover why God made you. Two great days, day you're born, the the day then the day you discover why you're born and then we also not only want you to discover your purpose we want you to start to live on purpose um, the happiest people then have got great friends and great purpose and so if you want to be happy you also need healthy friendships and so that's what view group gives you and I found 
um, being in church, um, having that rhythm with friends and purpose, um, they've actually helped me because um, I've had friends encourage me to keep my rhythm personally. You know, and I, I remember coming to this church and even having this guy who was a mentor to me who actually just encouraged me to keep serving Jesus, to stay planted, how's my quiet times? And he actually helped me find this rhythm. Um, and so, so there's so many things that can help you. So maybe don't try to do this in isolation where you're doing this by yourself. If you haven't gone on this journey, get into a relationship with us and we can help you. We can get you, um, help you through your devotional life. And listen, if you do need, want to take a next step, right outside as you walk out, we've got an area where you can sign up for growth track or for a view group. And, and yeah, um, you can keep coming, keep going on the journey. Listen, this Wednesday, we are recording and celebrating our brand new song. So I encourage you to be here please you can book your seat this year but I reckon there'll be more than enough space as well book your seat come bring your world on Wednesday we're gonna have an amazing time celebrating we're gonna have an amazing night of worship so can't wait to see you are we gonna end with one more song no yes should we end with the song and then um, remember new people, you can use your voucher. And then we'd love to get you connected. Anything you need help with or prayer, we, please don't sort of wake up wondering what's gonna happen. Why don't you let us pray for you weekly, fill in your prayer requests. As you walk out the door, that section, that your next step section, you can also fill out your prayer requests and we can pray for you. We're gonna end with one song and then yeah, we're gonna go.